Um, uh, um, I, uh, 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 oh, I was just gonna say, I haven't, I haven't said um in a while. Uh, dang it. So what's up everyone, Mitch here, and obviously Grant from Authentic. Today, we're gonna do a little challenge. So we're gonna do a little get to know you. We have some questions set up. Um, but the kicker is anytime we say, um, during this process or answering a question, you have to do five squats. So the key is we're going to try not to say that word at all throughout. Probably won't happen, but yeah, exactly. Get ready. Um, but yeah, oh, we're going to try not to say five. it. We, that's five. We, yeah. And we got to call each other it. out if we do it. All right. You got so, Grant, you start with the first question. <laughs> the, pr the problem is last time we recorded a video, we said the word that we cannot say like 150 times, which I just said like, which is another filler word, but maybe that's for a different video for us not to say. So for today, just it's the one just word. That's all I can keep U -H -M. Track of, yeah. We can't say it. If you say it, you do five squats. Uh, oh. oh, do them, do them. <sighs> Okay, you start with a question then. I need deeper squats than that. There's Grant. a chair underneath my... Yeah, get that chair out of there. The problem First is question. whenever you transition between thoughts, you want to say the word that cannot be said. I need a better That's transition word, which it could be like, the next thing I'm going to say... How about no transition word? You don't need one. Correct. Yeah, that's better. Silence. Comfortable with that's silence. That's better. All right, what question Grant, you got Who is your me? hero? Who is your hero? Funny enough, uh, the first person that came to mind was Tiger Woods <laughs> because growing up, I was a golfer. My dad loved golf. He taught me and my brother how to play golf and we played competitively for a while. That's how you and I know each other is because we played college golf together. But I would say I kind of idolized him growing up, but now he's just someone that obviously he's a human. He's been through a lot. Um, and he's done a lot and had his transgressions, whatever. He's also, I think, a, also an amazing person. But I used to idolize him. As far as who I idolize now, I try not to idolize anyone or have a hero. Another person that comes to mind that fits me more now is Rich Roll, who is someone, he's a podcaster. He's a ultra, um, a triathlon. How do you, what do you call it? Ultra triathloner. He does like, he's done a ton of Ironmans and stuff like he's a triathlete. triathlete yeah. 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 And he just has this, uh, uh one, two, two, three, four. You can talk while you're doing it. Five. Multi yeah. It's not, it's not easy. He just has this way about him. He has this saying that is mood follows action. And he, that's one of the big things that's inspired me to like get really big into walking throughout the day. Um, uh, <clears throat> because we spend a lot of time behind our computers and I know that whenever I'm feeling a little bit down, going for a walk, just boosts my mood and makes me feel better. So I'd say he is one of my heroes now, but I, I try not to have any heroes cause that's not, I don't think a, a healthy thing. So yeah, to idolize anyone. But, uh, can I ask you a question now? Sure. Okay. I'm putting so much mental energy towards not saying, the word that can't be said. It's like hard to think sometimes. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, honestly. <laughs> All right. So question, would you rather vacation in Hawaii or Alaska and why? What a question. What a question is right. I would rather vacation in Hawaii just because I'm a big surfer, love surfing. Always wanted to go to the North shore, which is like Oahu and check out pipeline. Um, so for me, sweet. honestly, it's a no brainer. Did you just say, just uh? said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, probably go like hang out with Joe, Jamie O'Brien and then nice. you know, probably rip some barrels, maybe get like a, oh. <laughs> get a <laughs> poke bowl, get, did you say acai bowl <laughs> and yeah, just have a great time. Can I ask Our, you the same question? I'm curious. Fo I wait, like follow, follow up, follow up to that. And then I'll answer it. If you could go anywhere in the world, or if you could live in any place in the world, where would it be? That's so hard. I'm moving around so much right now. I'm kind of trying to figure that out. Yeah. I don't think right there's now, just one place. I don't think there's one place. I don't think it's so either. Right now, for other. me, I think it's New York City, though, and that is where I'm going. So, Sweet. 
How about you? I'm glad. I'm glad that's the case. Well, I would go to for the first question. I would go to Alaska because I grew up in Florida by the water, and Hawaii I know is so different than Florida, and is just a with the way it was formed and the mountains next to the water. I know it's crazy different. And the culture is probably super interesting. I'd love to learn about that. But Alaska just seems so majestic and huge. And I love the mountains. Like, there's so much that you can do in the mountains. I love camping and I love the open road. So I'd like to try Alaska because I feel like it is very, very different from what we normally see in the continental United States, which so is Hawaii. But how, how cool is it? Obviously, there's some issues with the American uh, occupation, basically, of Hawaii. And I know Alaska was purchased from, I'm not exactly sure who, but there's, I won't go too deep into the, the terrible history of, yeah, history of how we got our land. But uh, I would say that Alaska and Hawaii are two of the coolest places in the entire world. And Have you read Into the Wild yet? I've read it. I had to read it in high school and okay. watched the movie, I think, and... Christopher McCandless ends up going there. I was just going to say, don't pull. It's not a happy ending, or, but Alex Supertramp. Yeah, if you see a bus in the Alaska woods, maybe don't stay there. Wait, isn't his name Christopher McCandless? I think it's like Christopher McCandles. <laughs> Damn it! But he, but he goes but by, he, I, or his name's, but he goes by Alex Supertramp. Yeah, yeah. But his real you go to name, Alaska like, and, and get a new identity. That's it's kind of what it's all about. But all right, I'm going to ask you another question. Yeah. Go ahead. We're, I think we're doing all right. We've only had like five, five ums maybe. Not too bad. I feel like we probably haven't caught in all of them, but yeah. So be it. What did you want to be when you were little? This goes back to Tiger Woods. I wanted to be a professional golfer, but I also remember being at Carabas one time with my dad and I was really into RC cars at that time. I was like, I'm going to be a professional remote control car driver. And then I I kind of wanted to be an architect at one point, but I'd say the predominant thing throughout my young childhood was professional golfer. And uh, I'm not a professional golfer, but right now I'm taking disc golf, which is a lot like golf, but you play with a Frisbee and it's emerging. It's an emerging sport. It's an amazing sport. And I'm kind of continuing my, uh, my love of golf as a, as a kid and competing into disc golf now and trying to get as bad, as good as I can and just enjoy it along the way. So I'd say we're both a bit addicted to disc golf right now. Maybe more so you, but I've been playing probably three or four times a week here after yeah. work in Salt Lake city. Some good courses here, by the way, if you're a disc golf fan, great place to come. Um, I, but it's so I'm fun, so affordable hear about it. and, um, yeah, it's just accessible um, to everyone, it. which is nice. And you, you meet the nicest you. people. <laughs> Super nice course, people. If you want to learn anything about a local area, literally just go to the local disc golf course or any of them, and people will 100%. tell you everything. And they're so nice, and they usually have cool dogs that hang out with you too. So, yeah, that is like that was one of my favorite things when I was in Portland visiting Rushi. I went to I went to a bunch of disc golf courses and met a bunch of locals, and they're just super nice. You get to you got to lay the land pretty quickly. So it's a good way to get plugged in. Unlike any other sport, because running or biking or, you know, pick up basketball, like, I keep saying all these other filler words like like and you know, but I know we're not honing in on those, but I need, I need to get rid of those too. But yeah, this golf about is, is super social and uh, it's awesome. I, I'm kind just of jealous that you've been... Just did it. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Jealous that you've been playing disc golf courses though, because I just go to a field and I've been practicing shots, so it hasn't been quite the full experience. But I actually really enjoy practicing, just watching the disc fly. And I have five of each disc. Let me just grab them real quick. This has turned into a total disc golf video. Yeah, so we're gonna show. Is, oh, okay. I have more than this. First of all, I've got the rainbow in there. This is the thing. Developing consistency, all the discs have a different, obviously you know this, but all these discs have different flight characteristics. This one is v very different from these. You can see it's a thick, thicker, maybe it's kind of hard to see on video, but 
basically I've, I've started to buy like five of each disc. And when you throw five of them in a row, you just get a way better picture of the consistency and how they actually fly. And it's really fun to try to replicate the same throw like over and over and over and over. And I'm, I'm loving it. So very yeah, difficult to do it at the same time. Very difficult. Yeah. And Practice. every disc is a little different. So why don't we switch topics to uh, something other than disc golf? But I have a feeling we might come back to it. So we could talk about it for hours. What's your favorite zoo animal? This could just also be what's your favorite animal. Yeah. So I'll do my favorite animal. Very strange niche one. I absolutely love rock copper penguins. You go, you go to the, the Boston Aquarium, which Grant and I went to a bit. Grant yeah. actually had a membership. Had a membership. <laughs> he is very, you still do, very dedicated to the Boston Aquarium, dedicated goer. Um, <laughs> I just love rock copper penguins. There's also this movie called Surf's Up where the yeah. penguins surf. And Big Z and, like, I think there's some other characters who are rock copper penguins. I just think they're so funny. Um, and they, like, squawk and then they jump in the water dive in very cool funny yeah let me can i ask a better question because that one was so you You don't want to talk about rock hoppers basic not not that not that your answer your answer was great but i just don't think the the uh question was all that good let me okay are you i'm going to adapt this question a little bit but are you an introvert or an extrovert and based on your answer what advantages do you think that that comes with in the work that we do at Authentic? So are you an introvert or an extrovert? And if so, why do you think that that's an advantage for your work with what we do? Yeah, that's a deep question. <laughs> the problem I would say is I'm, I would say I'm very close to like 50, 50 introvert, extrovert. Yeah. It's weird. I would say growing up, I was a total introvert. But in the past few years, uh, I'll after college, you. I've become like a total extrovert. I like talking to people now. Um, I don't know. I think I've just become more comfortable with who I am entirely. Not that I wasn't before. I'd say like 98% there. But now I'm like 100% there. The last 2% are really hard. I don't care what people – the hardest, yeah. But I really don't care what people think that much anymore, which is nice. Um, so – <laughs> I'd say I'm more of an extrovert that I do it again. No, no, no. I was just laughing because as you're talking about like not caring what about what people think of us, we're creating this really weird video doing squats. Funky video. Answering, yeah. Um, but it's great. Yeah, I did it again. But <laughs> I'll just say I'm 50-50, honestly, and I think it right. helps me in a lot of ways because I can still interact well with like clients, people we're working with, uh, potential people we might hire, and um, – but I still have that introverted, self-aware self that uh, I'm like out of breath right now. <laughs> you said it, you said it one more time. I'm doing it for you though, because you're uh, no, I'll do you're em. a little out of breath. <laughs> Gotta do them. Yeah, it's a hard question. The but the, the kind of both, and it helps me in a lot of ways. I, there, I, there's a whole list I could go go through. The best way I've heard introversion versus extroversion described is what gives you energy. Like if you go to a party and you're in a big social situation, do you feel drained afterwards and exhausted or do you feel energized? And then when you spend time alone, introversion, do you, are you energized? Are you, have you heard it described that way before? I have. Yeah. So I, don't think I it would accurately say. accurately reflects. Yeah. I don't know. Both help me at different times. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I don't think anyone you? is fully introverted or fully extroverted, but I would say for the most part, I get more energy from being alone. Like this morning I went for a walk and I didn't bring my phone. I went to this, the top of a hill, this building at, in Tufts, Tufts campus. I live right near Tufts University in Somerville and overlooked Boston. And, uh, I would, I was just closing my eyes, doing some meditation and felt, I just felt so much, so energized and excited for the day. And I think of so many instances where I have been in social situations where afterwards I just feel exhausted. And though for me, what I've realized is that I'm really good with one-to-one -one conversation. I can hold a conversation with, with another person, but when, when I'm in a big group of people, I kind of become like more of a listener and it can be very, very exhausting for me. Although I would say when I join some Twitter spaces, I like to get pretty vocal in there. 
but that feels a little bit different than like a standard party you would go to. So I, I think I get more energy from, from spending time alone by myself than I do from, from being in big groups. But I think that it's been an advantage for me with work is that like when you're in a sales conversation or you're doing a podcast or like what we're doing right now is you're just talking to one human and you just have to focus on them and ask questions and have a good time. And that, that's fun for me. And I think that introverts can be really good at one-to-one -one conversation, but generally aren't as good at like the bigger groups. So that's, that's what I would say I am more so, more so introverted, but you might it's not funny expect because, that because yeah. Yeah. If anybody met you, I would say they would think you're a total extrovert, especially in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, but well, j just because introverts like, can be extroverted in a, are extroverted in a one-on-one -on -one scenario as well. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, I think you can be like sociable as a person and maybe, maybe funny or engage with a group of people, but not necessarily get energy from it. And, uh, that's, so that's how I feel. It's like, yeah, I can, I can handle other people, but I kind of like being alone a lot of the time or just with one on one-on-one. -on -one. So I love going mm -hmm. for walks with people and stuff like that. That's like my favorite thing to do. All right. Next question. Let's do a fun one. I feel like people hear enough enough work stuff from us. Yeah, and, that one was uh, kind of kind of perfect. I feel like. Yeah, the introvert extrovert dichotomy. Um, hmm. Even when I'm asking a question, I'm saying the word. You just said. Mm. I'm, yeah, that was more yeah. of like a contemplative. Like it wasn't like a filler. I I'm gonna have a way harder time not saying like than I am saying um, because it's just more ingrained into my. Into my language, I feel like I you guess. haven't said it that much. I had to include it there. Okay. Grant, I want to know. This is a more <laughs> fun one. And I don't think I've ever heard you do this. What would you sing at karaoke? I was just looking at that question. I was like, I have no idea how to answer that. But Perfect. I'll put you on the spot. What's the first thing that came to your head? The first thing that came to my head was the national anthem. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know the full lyrics of that. And then the second one, I'd probably, probably J something Jack Johnson. I love Jack Johnson. Probably banana, banana pancakes by Jack Johnson. That would, that would be it. Wow. Which you're really starting the party. Go something. <laughs> Everybody's going to fall asleep on the couch. They're going to leave. Is this karaoke good, like, at like a coffee shop? Karaoke. Actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's your open mic opportunity at the local coffee shop. I go to bed at like nine o'clock every night. So I don't think I even have karaoke opportunities other than at coffee shops. So yeah. One weekend, man, go out, maybe hit the Hong Kong in Cambridge. You can sing a little karaoke. I mean, maybe in your next life. I should try it. I think it would be, I think it would make, make you a better person, even if you suck. So let yeah. me ask you a question. This just made me think of something else. Would you ever try stand-up comedy? Like go do like a one-minute set or a, a five-minute set? I said, oh, in Boston somewhere? <laughs> like, is that something you could ever see yourself doing? I feel like introverts can do that. Oh, 100%. One -on -one I've, I've thought about it. I've, I've, I think that like, honest, honestly, if everyone in their life did comedy once, we kind of have, I think it's a really big growing experience. And... Performing in I, general, kind of, yeah. I think I'd have fun. I think I'd have fun with it. I know it would be terrifying. So I get in front of crowds and I like shake and I sweat, and it's just. It, I would have to do some writing, but I. I think that I can say some funny things, but as far as the hard part is like, catering to the audience. I feel like a lot of my humor is like funny because my friends know me and they get my quirks, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I would I would consider trying it, and I feel like it would be a good growing experience. But I, I have not mustered. You know what? I haven't mustered up the motivation to do it. Like, if it's you know, why why would I do it? I need to have a really good reason. Right now, I just feel like it would be a backseat thing. I don't know. I don't know. I know, and I know you love comedy, and you've kind of mentioned that you probably wouldn't want to do it. But why not? Why wouldn't you do I it? I think I have to, honestly. I, I watch so much of it. That just for the like, emp empathy of it? G literally, yeah. To empathize with how hard it is and like, yeah. 
I think it would just be such an interesting experience and it would give you a whole new appreciation for it. It's kind of like anything, like you don't appreciate how hard a marathon is until you actually do one. You're like, wow, these people crush it. I haven't even done one, but you, yeah. you have uh, on your own time. It's hard, yeah. But yeah, yeah the marathon, just between... like, hey, go ahead. I was going to say like comedy, like a marathon, you don't run a marathon the day of the marathon. It really happens in the training. I'm sure there's some people who go out there and they've done no training at all. They haven't run for their entire lives and they complete it. It's definitely possible, but like marathons happen because you've done so much training. I feel like comedy is the same way. You know, just because you're a funny person doesn't mean you'll do well in comedy. It's like a totally different thing. And I've always like growing up, like I was, my parents were really good storytellers and I had no idea how they did it. They were just so funny and they'd tell like, the funniest stories. What I noticed though, is that my mom will tell the same story over and 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 over. And that's your mom, by the way, that's everybody's parents. I feel I just said it. Oh yeah. Everyone. And it's, I lost my train of thought. The story is a little bit different each time when she tells it, but it's always equally as funny. And I feel like that's what comedians do is they have these stories or these plot lines and they're able to like mold them to their audience. And I've noticed this with people like Gary Vaynerchuk, like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson is my perfect, my favorite example because he's an astrophysicist and he's like, teaches all of this sciencey stuff with the coolest metaphors. But if you watch 10 of his videos, a lot of the time he just tells the same story and he, every time he gets better and better at it. So I think that comedy is like, all happens when the writing and the practice and just repeating it over and over and over again. So definitely mad respect for comedians to do it because you don't just do it overnight. So, yeah, I, I think, think it's amazing it, how much your success up. in life can be dictated by your storytelling abilities. Yeah. Like making new friends, um, in business, like if you're a teacher, like that's how you hammer home points. There's so many uh, applicable areas for storytelling that it's so valuable. But yeah, I, I should what, try it. I did. What would be? Do you have any bits that you would? I've been thinking about a few. I haven't written them <laughs> down. I have topics. I have a similar issue where it's like with you and like our friends or your friends, the quirks, like a lot of inside jokes that my group chat of high school friends would laugh at, but. Anybody yeah. else would be like, what the hell are you saying? So you just got to have them show up every time you perform. Exactly. And, you and just have them, there'd be like a laugh track for me, basically. And they're like, oh yeah, that's <laughs> funny. I'm going to laugh too. I'll come yeah, back to you I, a bit at some point. Maybe on the I'll next squat video. Yeah. yeah. I can bomb on the internet, which makes it even worse because more people can see it. But hey, got to start somewhere, right? I will say that every time I go to a comedy show, I have this, I have this deep urge that, or like, desire that they'll randomly just call me up to the front and be like, all right, it's that happened last time I was, Oh, to perform. Okay. never mind. Call, like literally call me up and that, but it also terrifies me. So sometimes I'm, I'm like, I think about that. I'm like, this would be so exciting. It'd be so exciting. And I'm like, Holy crap. That'd be terrifying. I would bomb. I would destroy. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know how to entertain an audience. I would, maybe it would be so spur of the moment. In that case, I feel like I need to have some type of bit. It's like built out that could be, it could be somewhat entertaining. And yeah, that would, that'd be fun. You need a Justin Gaines awesome. bit. I, dude, I so agree with you. What you're saying about this storytelling thing is it helps you in every bit of life. And when are you ever taught storytelling in school? I don't, I mean, we're taught writing and stuff like that, but I feel like it's more from a grammatical sense and how to hammer home a point, but not as much about the story. And you story give speeches aspect. in school, right? But you're not really telling, you're supposed to tell some sort of story or make it good. But the stuff from like real life is so much more applicable to like relatable versus if you're like writing a report on who knows, Alexander Hamilton, like, yeah, you're going to tell a story about him, but it's not going to be great or that interesting. I don't know. <laughs> so it's just like real life stuff that people can really relate with is. And I was yeah. thinking when you said like your parents always told stories, like when you're growing up, 
at least for me, like I wasn't the one sitting at dinner telling stories. Um, it's usually like a parent's role. And then when does it get 100%. passed on? I don't know. I mean, when you like go to school and you're like with your friends, but if you're not taught or you're not, yeah, privy to, to being the storyteller, you, at least for me, I always kind of like sat back. And that's something you have to learn as you grow up. Uh, I mean, you don't have to, but yeah, it's such I, a, I was such the same way. Tool. Such I was a, the same way. My, one of my mom's bosses asked me once, he goes, why do you not talk? <laughs> or like, why are you so quiet? <laughs> and my response, I was like eight or nine. I was like, it's because my mom's the one always talking <laughs> and she's hilarious. I didn't mean as an insult. It was just truth. It's like my mom's a storyteller. Whenever, whenever I would, whenever, like sometimes she would ask me to tell the story. I'm like, mom, no, you do it way better. I'm too embarrassed. But now it's kind of reversing. It's like sometimes I'll tell the story. Sometimes she'll tell the story. So, but yeah, it's, I, I totally see what you're saying. I was, I was so cool. I did not like telling stories as a kid, but here we are. It's just a practice thing. It's such it a is. practice thing. You get your time. You got to build experience. You build those stories. And then we're getting to an age where, uh, that we share them and they actually matter a bit more. They always matter, but more people can relate to them. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's keep working on that skill. I think what story are we telling right now in this video? I don't know. There's a lot of different stories. Story but... of two nut jobs doing squats on video. Yeah. Overall, I the story is it's really hard not to say the word that cannot be said mm -hmm. and think about what you're you just got to practice it. I guess the, and this is this is us practicing reducing the filler words. Luckily though, with all the video editing plot, like Descript that we use, you literally just right click and it deletes all the, and you know, you select all the text and then click remove filler words and it immediately erases all the filler words. It's, it's like an absolute life hack, but I would rather learn how to actually not say filler words because I would save time in editing and just, I think make you a better speaker. So agreed. That was a perfect Descript ad, by the way. I talk about Descript like spot four times video. a day. <laughs> it's insane. Every Speaking single broken, video. Broken records. That's your story. Make, you tell the Descript story. It's such a good tool. It is such a good tool. We have an affiliate link down below. If you're interested. Click it. Click it. Yeah. Click it. I dare you. All right. I think, uh, oh, I was just going to say. I haven't, I haven't said um in a while, but here I am doing squats. It's hard to even pay attention to when you're saying it. So focused on what I'm saying, I forget if I actually say it. And it's hard yeah. to call the other person out because, I don't know, it's just hard. You're trying to you're trying to listen to what they're saying, not be a police exactly. officer. We almost need, like, a moderator here to, to uh, be the person that enforces it. Next time. What do you think? One more question or should we wrap it up? Do one more. Okay. I need to do a few more squats. Doesn't have to be on the hmm. list either. You going on the top of your head? Okay. What's the longest you've gone? What's the longest you've gone without sleep and why? The longest I've gone without sleep is not for good reasoning. In middle school, one of my good friends, Zach, uh, dang it. His family has a beach house that we would go to. <laughs> And they had, this was like in the early days when like Keurigs were new and we were just like discovering coffee. So we liked to pull oh, all boy. nighters in middle school. There was also a 7-Eleven, like maybe half a mile down the road. And we got five hour energies, which, oh God. And we would drink coffee and we wanted to, our goal was just to stay up all night. And then we stayed up until I think like noon the next day. <laughs> and then I felt so sick. We went out to d dinner with his dad that night. I literally felt so sick to my stomach. It was not worth it at all. Such a pointless, I mean, it's so fun in like middle school, just stay up with your friends all night, like watch movies and, you know, joke around. So it was worth it, but that's the reason I've stayed up the latest. Well, how much did you sleep the next day? I don't remember. I think we just went to bed early at probably like eight or something because I didn't, didn't feel well. So it kind of ruined yeah. the next day, which is yeah, always worth it. It's crazy. It'll wreck your body. I did it. I did it once in middle school too, believe it or not. That was the last time I did it, but I did it for a book report. I was like, so, so 
such a procrastinator, but I was also a good student. So I wanted to do a good job on this diorama and stayed up all night. And my dad came in at like 6 a.m. He's like, Grant, did you wake up early? I was like, no, I just stayed up all night. He's like, <laughs> I can't remember his reaction, but I don't know if he was what? proud of me or he was confused, but I ended up going to school that next day too and told my professor, I was in like seventh grade. So she- Your seventh grade her, professor? Yeah, my seventh grade teacher, whatever. <laughs> her response was, why didn't you just tell me? Like, I would have given you an extra day. <laughs> And, uh, but I honestly don't, I don't really believe her. I feel like if I would have reached out and said that she would have said, yeah, you can turn in the next day, but it would be 10% off. So I just remember getting home from school that next day. And at three o'clock I fell asleep and slept in until like 10 AM the next day. It was, it was like 18 hours of straight sleep. So I have never done that since. And now I go to bed at nine and nine to 10 and wake up with the sun and I, I like can't even imagine doing that again. It would just destroy me. So, yeah, sleep is key. Sleep is. It's key. amazing how when you're like that age or anytime like middle school, elementary school, even high school, you take your teacher's word as like gospel. Oh it's my gosh! Like, yeah, I can. I cannot. Everything's negotiable. <laughs> disobey. Literally everything's negotiable. Um, oh darn it! <laughs> but I, I have a funny, a quick story about that from when I was in uh, kindergarten, actually. I was such like a little good boy and uh, my real name's Michael. I don't know how many people know that, at least on the internet. A lot of my friends know that. And there was a bathroom uh, board where you grab your name to go to the ba uh, bathroom and give it to the teacher. And so the name Michael was up there, but I thought my name was Mitch. And so I thought I couldn't go to the bathroom because my <laughs> name wasn't up there. And apparently my mom re retells the story, speaking of parents telling stories. I would run home every day, or not every day, but most days, and go straight to the bathroom. And my mom's like, Mitch, is like, everything okay? And I'm, I literally said to her, I can't go to the bathroom. My name's not on the board. <laughs> so she called the teacher to be like, oh, he thinks his, like, his name's Mitch. It's my nickname. Um, so she had to change it. And it's like so funny how <laughs> when you're like younger, yeah, like you said, things seem non-negotiable or like you're like afraid to ask or stuff like that. But then as you get older, you just realize yeah, you can just be like, I need a little more time. You mind? And they can yeah. say no, but a lot of times they say yes. Dude, that, that is a lot of times they let you go to the wild. bathroom once they put your name up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything's negotiable. <laughs> even your bathroom times. That's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. You and I were definitely goody two shoe kids. I, yeah, I know that. I think we kind of still are, but maybe we've realized what's, uh, what's malleable and what's, what is gospel. But yeah, very I few think we're, things we were are good at actually. seeing through the bullshit, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Part of my French. We, we. All right, I think I think we did like. I bet I did eighty squats. Maybe you did like one hundred and twenty. That's pretty good. Five more. That's a good workout. I'll, I'll get in some more. I'd say I'd say that's pretty good. I think this is a a productive. Get my ski legs uh, ready for the weekend. Get to know you session. Yeah. Yeah. How do we sign off? If you made it this far, I hope you did a few squats too. And thanks for watching. Get the blood pumping today. Peace.